glory and honor and praise and adoration and our thanksgiving because of just this beautiful ministry time of just entering in and worshiping you, coming into the courts of heaven and blessing your holy name. And King Jesus, we enthrone you in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, in every place that you have entrusted us to march and to occupy, we proclaim your lordship and your kingship. Mm -hmm. And now, Lord, we thank you for the ministry of your word. Yes. Thank you, Would you speak to us, bring your counsel, bring your truth, reveal the heart and mind of God to us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wonderful. It's been awesome, you know, the last uh, couple of days, and we thank the Lord that he can even usher us into a new uh, season uh, as he speaks to us, his commands and his directives. Amen. Um, today I want to share with us about an interesting topic, but the Holy Spirit showed it to me and we will look at a number of scriptures in relation to this theme area of discussion and I'm calling it the empowering our lives and ministries and securing our cities and nations by searching out and tracing, tracing and honoring the mantles, the mantles, tracing and honoring mantles. And we'll discover from a number of portions of scriptures that uh, uh, the Lord has put on my heart uh, to discover really what God wants us to capture by His Spirit today. Amen. Amen. Uh, Psalms 103 and verse 7, God speaks to uh, David and he declares and says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. And I discovered that as we, uh, as ministers of Christ, as intercessors, as the remnant, as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, as we continue journeying in this Christian life and journey and ministry, and especially in the end times, we need to be constantly aware that God wants to reveal two things. One. He wants to reveal and deposit to us his ways as much as he would want to reveal to us his works. But David actually declares and says there is something that he looks back to Mo in the day of Moses and discovers that God was doing. And he says to Moses... God revealed his ways. But for the children of Israel, he revealed his works. Interesting. It may seem like a very simple statement, but it has depth to it. What are we seeking for? Are we seeking his works or his ways? In Psalms 25 and verse 14, the psalmist writes and says, The secret of the Lord Amen. is with those who fear Amen. him, and he will show them his covenant. And so I discover that God has some treasures of heaven. He has secrets of his heart, and he desires to unveil them to those who fear him. But because of the stubbornness mm. of the hearts of the children of Israel, mm -hmm. he did not show them his ways. Mm. He showed them his works. Mm. Mm. But for the man of God, Moses, who loved God and became a friend of God and was ushered onto the mountain into the presence of God 
and he made a demand to the in the throne room of God saying Lord show me your face show me your glory and this man at one time he says Lord if you don't go with us we cannot even move away from here the Bible teaches us that to that man Moses God showed him his ways and this brings me to an important question in the context of the past revivals and moves of God. What is it that caused some of those wells to dry up mm. and those seasons to pass quickly? Is it because the people were more accustomed to just see the works of God and did not discover the ways of God? Possibly. And I believe that in these end times, and especially with what God wants to do with the end time revival, God wants us to go beyond the works and discover his ways. Amen. And one of the ways of God is to do, discover the secret of his heart concerning his servants who carry the mantles and anointing that represents himself wow. and honoring those gifts and mantles. And when I talk about tracing and honoring these mantles, I'm talking about seeking out and discovering where where is this man of God? Where is this woman of God? Because they carry a portion of God himself. Okay? And we'll discover it. And Jehoshaphat, in the days of Jehoshaphat, in the days of the king, 2 Kings 3.11, Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? What I want us to see, brothers and sisters, is the fact that in that day of Jehoshaphat and in the Bible days, there was an honoring of the mantles that were deposited on God's servants. And they just did not look at these functions just as titles and things, but even as a king, knowing that they were beset with enemies and challenges and great opposition, Jehoshaphat disciplined himself or he spoke out, which what I believe we need to begin to speak out today. And that question was, is there no prophet of the Lord? Where is the man of God where is the woman of God who has access to the secrets of God? Amen. That he can apportion those secrets to us for our success, for our victory, and for our breakthroughs. I do believe, brothers and sisters, that... We are living in a dysfunctional society today in many ways. When you look at the breakdown in our marriages and families, mm -hmm. it depicts something in the spiritual arena. And I feel like the enemy has really bombarded the family structure to try and come against the divine order of God Amen. for humanity. Because when you deal with, when you destroy marriage and family, you are actually destroying the foundational principles of God for humanity. And there are us to bring confusion and to bring a disarray which then robs humanity from the real secrets of God and the power that he wants to manifest. Mm -hmm. But talking about mantles, 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, each one of us, as the body of Christ, and in particular, the ministers that God raises up as ministers according to the Ephesians 4, 11 ministry, uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 ministry offices, Paul brings out this important truth that each one of us, grace was given. And this grace is that favor of God that life of God, that intention of God, which then releases a measure of Christ's gift. That means in each one of his servants, Christ apportions a measure of himself in them. I cannot be the fullness of Christ. But together, we represent the body Amen. of Christ. Amen. And therefore, when you dishonor one member of the body of Christ, you are actually dishonoring Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to discover this that I'm sharing with us so that the culture and the value and the principle of honor can be fully restored in the body where we walk with reverence and fear and saying, where is the woman of God? Where is the man of God? Where is the carrier of the portion of Christ that is needed to make me complete? Someone once taught about he was teaching about communion and he quoted from the passage that Paul writes and says, you know, when we come together to partake of the Lord's table, let each one examine themselves that there are some who have fallen, who have slept because of dishonoring the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he said, that goes beyond, that communion, that moment of communion, it goes beyond the drink and the bread. It literally brings us to the life experience of Christ here on earth and among his people and the need for us to discover how Christ has apportioned himself in all of us. And when we speak ill of one another, even when we speak ill of the weaker members of the body, mm. we are speaking against Christ himself. Mm. And we need to come back to understand mm -hmm. that Christ has apportioned himself in many members. Mm. Okay? And verse 8, he says, uh, we're looking at Ephesians 4, we look at verse 8, it says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. I believe these gifts are representative of the mantles and the powerful gifts of authority and anointing that Jesus has apportioned in us as his ministers and in one another as ministers of the body of Christ. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, Peter writes us and says, as each one has received a gift, now Christ has given a gift, but then he turns and says through Peter, as each one has received a gift, Minister it to one another. Okay? So when we point fingers and dishonor the gift that of Christ that is in each one of us, we are actually creating a blockage mm -hmm. of Christ actually impacting our lives 
with the gift that is found in the other. You can bring it home even in the context of marriage. When there is disagreement and when there is abuse and a dishonoring of one another in a partnership or in a relationship of two, there are certain limitations that begin to occur in the family and the joy is robbed away. The full intent of God for the two to experience love and harmony and peace and breakthroughs is limited. And in the same way, as we journey on in our Christian faith, pursuing God and accessing the realms of His Spirit, we must rediscover the essence of honoring one another, the gifts that He has apportioned to all of us so that we can be ushered into greater levels of breakthrough. Yeah. And so Peter says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. So these mantles are released so that we can utilize them for the benefit, for the breakthroughs, for the success of one another. And even as we come together in corporate, in a corporate sense, with these gifts and mantles, the fire and the glory becomes more intense, which then helps us to minister to our communities, our nations, our regions, our spheres of influence, our apportioned jurisdictions can have a test of God when the gifts come together in power. And he goes on to say, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So basically, what is Peter the Apostle revealing to us? He's saying those gifts that Christ has given to us by the way of the Holy Spirit within us, those gifts are a manifold grace. They are a taste of the manifold grace of God. It is basically that mantle represents the favor of God, the kingdom of God, the power of God, the miracle working God, working and existing and living within each one of us. Amen. And he says, let us be good stewards of that which Christ has apportioned in us. So we are called to steward power. We are called to steward wisdom, revelation, and anointing released from God himself. And that is why in a time of adversity, the king Jehoshaphat is saying, where is a man who has been apportioned with the gift of God? Where is a man who has been apportioned by this grace? Because we cannot overcome this adversity on our own. We need God. But the danger is, many of us, we have been accustomed to the works of God. And we forget the ways of God. And how God has apportioned himself here on earth. There are people, let me surprise us, there are people who don't have honor and respect for the rest of the body of Christ. And they think that they can retreat and go into a prayer closet and just have an affair with God in heaven. How can you say you love God in heaven when you dishonor the people Amen. that he has created in his own Amen. image and has apportioned himself by way of grace and gifts in your brothers and sisters? Amen. These things are heavy 
and very important for us to discover. And you will see the significance even as we move forward. So we are talking about this. I'm trying to explain to us through revelation of scripture to understand the power and the significance and the importance of the mantles and the gifts of God that are deposited in his ministers and in one another. Romans 1 and verse 11. Paul breaks it down for us. And there are four key components of this verse that I want to bring out by help of the Holy Spirit to us. Number one, Paul is having like a deep burning spiritual desire. And the New King James, he says, I long for, I long to see you. There is a longingness. There is a deep desire. And I do not believe that this is a carnal, fleshly desire. This is God himself, I believe, that is burning within the heart of his servant, Apostle Paul. He's saying, I long to see you. For what reason? That I may impart to you some spiritual gift. Wait a moment. The Apostle, Romans 1, verse 11. Thank you. Hold on a moment. I thought we can just go to our prayer closets and meet with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit makes a direct deposit. He can, but I'm going to show you that God has set divine protocols in the spheres of men. And when we miss those protocols, we can see his works, but miss his ways. And so Paul gives us the reason for his longing desire to meet the saints. He says, I want to see you. There is a burning within me. Basically, his, if we can break that into, into aspects of deep spiritual understanding and revelation, it's like Paul is literally saying, friends, there is the gift of God through Christ in me that is bubbling up like a spring of life. There is a portion of Christ in me that I am waiting for that moment when I can see you. And as a steward, I want to share. I want to steward what God has given me to steward and to release a deposit in you. Of some spiritual gift. For what reason? He brings me to the fourth portion of the revelation in Romans 1 11. So that you may be established. So that we may be established. Now you can go into the English dictionaries and begin to research that word establishment. And that establishment, in my view, that the contrary of this truth can be true. That if we do not connect with men and women whom Christ has apportioned himself into them that they carry some spiritual gifts of power
power and anointing so that through connectivity and alignment and honoring of those gifts and honoring one another, if they fail to deposit those portions of Christ and the Holy Ghost in us, we may fail to be fully and well established. So then it provides a thought question that I would like to share with us. Is it possible that there are many Christians, probably not here, but they could be here, whose life and spiritual ministry has failed to be established? That means it has delayed in terms of being founded, being structured, being rooted to a place. You know, something that is established, even when the storm comes, it will keep standing strong. When the wind comes, it will keep standing strong. And Jesus likens this to the story of the two builders. There is a wise builder, he gets busy building. And there is a foolish builder. The foolish builder also gets busy building. But time and the storm come to test the work in terms of anchorage. Which building was anchored on the rock. I believe the wise builder, basically when you study this in context of the full counsel of God, the wise builder was not interested in mere works. He was interested in the secrets of God and in the ways of God. The ways of God are that you must dig deep and find the rock and build Amen. on the rock. rock. Yeah. That rock is Christ. That rock is revelation, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that flows from the Son of God. And when you are built on Him, when you go through the test of time and storms and adversity, when the winds come and the rains fall and the floods come, you shall remain established. Mm. Is it possible that the foolish builder missed out on the ways of God and possibly found his own ways which seem like within a short moment of time it's like popcorn <laughs> when you are preparing popcorn man and you're hungry and when they are popping out there on the pan or in the, on the pot you think like wow hallelujah let it get ready quickly because i'm going to get satisfied and you take a whole bowl of popcorn and you yes. You eat it and consume it, but the hunger does not go away. Right. Sometimes things that satisfy during the preparation, they don't make a lot of noise like popcorn. And so I can say by the Spirit of God that God will help us to move away from the mere works of God that are flowery, that are beautiful, they are powerful, they make us to go, wow, that is God, and begin to go into the deep ways, into the secrets, and say, Lord, thank you for the miracles and the bread and the fish that you can multiply and the healings that can be done and the tongues that we can speak and the prophecies that we can give. But you know the Bible teaches us that where there are tongues they will cease. Where there are prophecies they will, they will fail. So like we can come and engage the heavens of our God and say Lord thank you for the tongues. But let them stay 
stay behind for a moment. Thank you for the prophecies, but because they are temporary, they will cease. They are not eternal. Lord, push them aside for a moment and come to the place of encounter and just say, Lord, I am not satisfied by the works that you can do. I want to know the secrets of your heart. Reveal and deposit to me the spiritual gifts that help me to discover who you are and your ways and your grace and your mercy. And who am I that you have mercy on me and that you consider me? Lord, help me to discover the intentions of your heart so that I can be established. And I can tell you that when we begin to dig deep, when we begin to go deep, we will get established. Amen. Those are powerful things that you see Paul revealing by the Spirit for portions. And like I said, number one, there is a longing. And that longing is not just flesh and blood. It is the deep well within the man of God, the Apostle Paul. It's bubbling, it's springing up, it's the spiritual uh, well that is boiling up and it's ready to be transferred through a way of impartation to the next generation, to those that have known and discovered the secret of following after the leader and, and joining in and aligning with those that have the gifts of God. He's wanting to impart these gifts. And these are not just Paul's gift, they are spiritual gifts. Yes. <laughs> yes. It is good to have time alone with the Lord. But I tell you, friends, it is possible that we may need to also restructure our time with God where, apart from worshipping and adoring Him, asking Him, Lord, show us your mantles and those that you have deposited those mantles in our jurisdiction so that, Lord, when I come out of the prayer closet, I can find them. I can find them and I can sit under them and say, carrier of mantle from heaven, carrier and the you stewards of the gifts of heaven, would you lay hands on me? Would you prophesy? into me? Would you steward something into my life? Because without you as representatives of him, without you speaking and writing something in my heart, into my life, my destiny will lack establishment. Unfortunately, like I say, the enemy has bombarded the family unit and, and, and especially in a nation, in a postmodern society like one here in America. These things are dysfunctional and everyone is so independent, independent and we are so fragmented and we care less about honoring the gifts and the mantles that God has placed in those that he has chosen. We could run from one conference to another, but when we miss the ways of God, we will just see the wax. We will see the miracles and the power, Amen. but we will miss the ways. I pray that the ecclesia that is assembled here will find the ways of God. The hometown of Jesus, they missed out on something. In Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verse 53 to 58. Matthew 13, 53 to 58. This is what the Bible says. Now it came to pass 
when Jesus had finished these parables, okay, when it came, it came to pass, when Jesus has finished these parables, that he departed from there. And you can read the preceding verses, you will see Jesus not only sharing parables, but powerful things are happening through his ministry. People are getting healed, people are getting delivered, things are, the works are being done and seen by the multitudes. And then verse 54 says, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom? Take note of that. Take note of the question they asked. They're asking, where did this man get this wisdom? So they are seeing wisdom in his speech. They are seeing mighty works in his ministry. But then there is a spirit that causes dishonor, that plagues their hearts and minds. And look at verse 55. It captivates, captures their hearts and minds. And look at verse 55. They begin to define this man Jesus in context not of the mantle and the gift from heaven but according to flesh and blood. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? They are messing up that spirit of dishonor, messing up the identity that God desired for them to see that this is a man who has the river of life. This is the son of God. They become so blinded to that reality and they begin to define and understand the man Jesus according to flesh and blood. This is Mary's son. This is just another American from Missouri. Did he not just come from Sparta? Did he not, doesn't he just live around? Does, isn't that church just right around the corner? We know him. We know him. Even his youthful scenes, we know him. We know his character. That they become blinded to the gift from heaven. And his brothers, wow, look at this, wow. <laughs> the spirit of dishonor. And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? He's like saying, who is this one who is thinking he's special and is not with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Look at the end result of the despise and dishonor. They took up offense, 57. So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country. That means Jesus is literally telling them, Everywhere else I have gone, I have been honored. The mantle, the gift that I carry, the anointing that I carry is respected and honored. How come I've come to my own people and you are so blinded of the realities mm. that represent my identity? Mm. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 58, or the scripture goes on to say, now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They failed to recognize the mantle and the gift of God right. in the man Jesus. Right. It closed up there the heavens right. so that the gift of God could not mm. literally mm. and fully be manifested mm. in that area. And that's the challenge question that I wish to present to us 
as an ecclesia that is gathered and assembled here in the throne room of God today. Is it possible that some miracles have been delayed because of a spirit of dishonor in the land mm -hmm. yes. where we have not honored and regarded mm -hmm. the veterans of the faith? Mm -hmm. Think about how much we honor until even society honors the veterans of war. And we call the whole nation to attention to honor them. My big question is, when will the army of God come to its senses and begin to honor the mantles and the anointing that God has released to his stewards so that we have a kingdom veterans day where we can even find and research and discover where are the missionaries that come from Missouri, for example, that have gone to the nations and have caused explosions of revival. Where are they that we can acknowledge them and honor them? We may not have much to offer them in terms of reward, but because they are stewards of the power of God, let us love them, let us honor them. I tell you, friends, there are ministers who are getting back to heaven and they are going back with the mantles that they were supposed to release here or not. Mm. 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 And like the psalmist says, Selah. Mm. Wow. Is it possible society is crumbling today? because of the spirit of dishonor that we have not become like Jehoshaphat mm -hmm. that says where is a carrier of the mantle that has the secrets of God's heart concerning America that we may inquire of them. Second Chronicles 20, 20, so they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood there and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Again, the king has come to his senses because there was an adversity. There is an uh, their armies, their kings, their kingdoms coming against them. But as he has inquired of the Lord, the prophet of God has provided solution in how to overcome the enemy, releasing or stewarding the, the, the revelation, knowledge, and skill from heaven that helps them to overcome their enemy. And then he says, remember this, O Israel. O Judah, remember this. And hear me well. As you believe the Lord your God, make due efforts to know the stewards of the mysteries of God that he has mantled and placed in and among you. <coughs> Believe them as well. It is not enough just to believe in your God, but it's also important to believe and honor those that he has mantled. As I was studying this and downloading this from the heart of God, he takes me to Luke 24 and verse 25, the road to Emmaus. And Jesus 
walking with these two gentlemen as they are reasoning among themselves of all that has happened. They've crucified, they've killed the Son of God. They are wondering, what is this? And in verse 25, he says, Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Is it possible that the confusion in the land, the division is because we have become foolish? Not foolish in our intellectual sense, but foolish from a divine sense. And I, like I always say, I would rather that intellectually we become fools, but God never to judge us as fools. But for these two gentlemen, Jesus rebukes them and says, you foolish ones. Why did you not believe the prophets? Why did, you be, why did you not believe the stewards of the mantle and the grace that I have set them before you to speak to you? Why did you not believe them? Mm -hmm. Let me wrap up my sharing with some important truths here. The time is limited. I want to wrap up and just in about 10 minutes we should be done. But I'm reminded of the story of Jesus coming down from Galilee to Jordan. Look at Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3 in verse 13 to 15, here is what the Bible says. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him. Why did John try to prevent him? And he, he saw that this is the original this is what I have known by the Spirit. This is the original. Even the gifts that I carry, they come from this man. And suddenly the original stands right before him and says, I too want to be baptized by you. Wow. And John resists. He says, no way. I have been preaching about you. And there is one who will come and baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. For me, I'm limited to just the baptism of water. But you are the original. Even what I carry is, is from you, Jesus. How, how dare you tell me that I baptize you? Jesus answers, let's read on. We are trying to discover the treasures of heaven, the secrets of God, mm -hmm. the ways of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Let me pose a theological debate question. What really was the righteousness in that moment? What really was the righteousness? What is it that Jesus, what righteousness does Jesus want to fulfill? Is it an immersion in the water? Did Jesus really need the baptism in the water? What about the thief on the cross? What righteousness did he fulfill in order to access paradise with Jesus? There was no water baptism. Right. So what is the righteousness here? The secrets of God. Mm -hmm. 
the, the secrets of God, the ways of God. Jesus, he understood the divine protocols established in the spheres of humanity. We could wait until we ascend into heaven and get an answer to all questions, but um, permit me to propose to us that the righteousness that Jesus was seeking to fulfill was to honor the forerunner. You came before me and my father and I deposited a gift in you and you carry a mantle and this mantle you carry I cannot bypass you and think I will succeed without your blessing. John Permit, permit it to be so, John. Baptize me so that we fulfill the divine order set among men. Please baptize me so that the portion of God that is in you, you can steward it and pass it on to me as well. Because I have come to save but even though I am the Christ, but I know the protocols, just like I would have come in a glorious way and brought salvation and judgment here on up, but I chose to follow the order of my Father in heaven in, in working and operating among men. I had to be born of a woman because that is the divine order that God has set and that's why Jesus one time says, those that came before me are thieves and robbers. Why did he say that? He was speaking of Lucifer who was cast out of heaven and he ascended and he descended into the realms of men, not in the divine set order of being born of a woman. And that's why he's called a thief and a robber because he has access the earthly domain away from the order and the protocol that God had set in his eternal nature and in eternal in eternity to eternity he set an order that those that come and have influence in the spheres and in the domain of humanity they must be born of a woman and that is why Jesus had to be born of Mary so that he could fulfill a divinely set protocol. Wow. And the same protocol wow. in terms of supernatural living and spiritual engagement and ministry, Jesus discovers that that order should never be violated. Mm -hmm. And he says, John, let us fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. And all righteousness is by living according to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I humble myself so that those that come after us, they can discover that they can go into their prayer closets, but until when they discover those that have gone ahead of them and submit one another to one another in love and in humility, until that is established clearly, they will not access the ways the way of God. Let me wrap up with this other portion. There's the story of Jesus meeting with Saul on the road to Damascus. The man is a persecutor of believers and Jesus meets with him and they have settled some scores right there. <laughs> and um, finally, this man, Paul, Saul, before he's converted to become Paul, he is um, <coughs> he's outshined by Jesus and he's hit by some blindness and he accesses the realms of revelation where Jesus himself reveals to him that I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Mm. 
and the man's soul is finished. He has no more life in him. But Jesus, because he has a mandate, he also wants to release a mantle to him, does not directly do it. He says, go to a particular street, to a particular house, and wait there. And you'll be shown what to do. The question is, Jesus, why are you delaying this business? Why don't you just settle it right there? Tell him what, you, what he needs to do. Commission him right there. Jesus knows that the Father has set an earthly protocol in dealing with humanity. Yes, Paul, I can do it. But you know something? We will be violating divine order. The divine order is humble yourself, go and wait until I find one whom I had set a mantle on him and he finds one of his disciples called Ananias, who is carrying also a mantle. There isn't much that is said about Ananias and his ministry. And that's why God is saying to you, do not despise yourself. You are a steward of a mantle, a gift, an anointing from heaven that can commission the great apostles of our day. And Ananias says, Lord, you're calling me to go and meet with this man. He's killing us. And Jesus says, there is work that he has to be to do. And there is suffering that he'll need to go through. But you know something? That work cannot take place if you, as my mantle carrier, if you do not go and deposit some spiritual gift in him, well, please go. Don't be afraid. And then the years goes, think about this. He undoes or he undoes what Jesus had done <laughs> in a sense. Because Jesus had hit this man with blindness. Right. Mm -hmm. But Jesus commissions one of his mantle carriers to go and restore blind, uh, sight mm -hmm. to the man that Jesus himself had mm -hmm. caused to be blind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think of the powerful collaboration that heaven has with the mantle carriers. Mm -hmm. For a moment I'm reminded the story of Miriam. Uh, when they began to murmur and complain against Moses. Mm -hmm. That was Miriam and who? Aaron. Aaron. Mm -hmm. And gee, God was so disappointed by them. Why? Why didn't you think about it? But I speak with this man in the cloud, in the mountain, face to face. Why didn't you consider the thought of what you are doing? Jesus, or rather the Father, God is simply telling them, why, why do you dishonor my protocols and my mantles? David discovered that secret. And he said, man, one whom God has mantled, let God deal with him by himself. I dare not stretch my hand against him. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. I wish the sun had stood still so that it would still be 10 a.m. <laughs> we would have gone on and on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, me too. <laughs> Oh. But I speak by the counsel of heaven Amen. that the end time move of God is not about events. The 
it is about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And that the family unit being restored. And when I talk about the family unit, I'm not just talking the biology aspect. I'm talking about the spiritual order. I was greatly pleased listening to Joyce here. She released a statement that is rare to find in the American church. And she referred to Alec and Jenny as dad and mom. Mm -hmm. Very rare to find that in the American. Actually, for all the years that I have served in America, I've not had that statement from a pulpit. The enemy has brought a lot of dysfunctionality of the family unit so that he can corrupt mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. But God is beginning to realign us to truth, Amen. to rediscover the secrets of God. Right. Where we can know the spiritual fathers and the spiritual mothers that are carrying wells of life, rivers of life, that are carrying spiritual gifts that if we align ourselves with, then we shall be established. Think about the wise men. They came from a distant land. They read the signs of the time and they knew there is a man with a mantle to be king, and they sought him. That's right. I pray that people will not come from distant lands to honor the mantles in your land wow. when you yourselves, as owners of the land, wow. have not been hit with that knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. I finished preaching, but let me share my testimony. That which I speak is not just from, neither do you get it from a theological school, but it comes from a place of encounter with God and relationship with God. I dropped out of high school in my third year of high school in Kenya. Because in Kenya we had to pay school fees. My parents could not afford the school fees. And it was a dark period of time, almost like seven years, sitting at home, not knowing what the future would hold, not knowing how I would ever make it in life. And in the midst of all the confusion, rebelliousness settled in, and I was rebelling against everything my parents had taught me concerning the Christian faith. A man of God who knew and understood my life comes to our home. He did not condemn me. He did not judge me. He just looked at me in the eyes and says, James, Look at your parents. They are sovereigns of God. Please minister to them. That simple statement births an understanding that had dodged my life up till then. I was about 22 years old at that time. It's like the, the eyes of my understanding were enlightened to discover that Peter and Hannah Marumba, who, those are the names of my parents. My father went to be with the Lord. My mother is still serving the Lord. It enlightened my, the eyes of my understanding to discover, oh, this far I have 
only been following dad and mom in a biological context. But the simple statement from the man of God ushered me into a new arena of understanding mm. that I need to align with my parents far and above the biological paradigm mm. is that they are carrying a mantle and grace and gift from God mm. as his servants mm -hmm. and I, I need to honor that mantle mm. friends because in Kenya it's not like here you can stay with your shoes for a whole year without ever polishing those shoes there's no dust unless if you live on a ranch where like uh, but in Kenya you have to polish your shoes almost every day I began to polish my father's shoes because I was still living with my parents. I began to polish his shoes every day as a ministry unto God. I would drive him to meetings, no more thinking about him in a biological context, but with honor and respect unto God as a man who carries a mantle <coughs> for my establishment and my blessing. Amen. It changed my life. And I began to be ushered into ministry. Strongholds that had bothered my life began to fall away. Mm. As the Lord began to discipline my life into godliness and righteousness. Mm. Is it because I had discovered the pathway of righteousness. Mm -hmm. I believe so. At one time, at one time, let me fast forward. I fast forward. Now, God had called me into ministry. I'm serving the Lord. I had started my ministry of traveling to the States and the initial years was a struggle and I could not afford to raise enough money every time whenever the Lord said go and this one time Maria tells me let's be saving some money so that when the time for the ministry comes and you need to travel you will not need to be in a desperate state of looking for the money for your ticket mm -hmm. So we had saved almost like $700 over a period of months because my trip to the States was getting close. And then my father comes to me, not knowing that we had $700, but he asked me, James, my son, I need to go to the village areas of Trukana, which is a desert area. We had set up a mission base there. See, I, want to, I need to go there because there's some ministry assignments. My finances are delayed. Would you, by any chance, have $700 that you can loan me and I will pay you back? Well, since it was a loan, I had to discuss with my wife and we agreed that we loan our dad the money. Several weeks down the road, and getting close to the date when he's supposed to pay me back, mm -hmm. the giver of mantles and gifts and grace visits me, and he says, son, do you remember the money you gave to your father? Yes, it is $700. Mm -hmm. He's about to pay me back because it is for my next ministry trip. Very well, son. I want you to pour it out as an offering unto me. Because in giving to your father, you did not give to your father. You gave to my servant. And in giving to my servant, you gave it to me. 
Wow. Now, in the early 2000s, in a Kenyan economic sense, $700 is not little money. Guess what my next question was? Lord, <laughs> all of it? <laughs> He said all of it. At that point, the Bible in me is activated. Out of the mouth of every two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Amen. This one, it may not be God. It, it could be just my own mind. <laughs> let me talk to Maria. And I talk to Maria and I'm now not telling her that says the Lord. I'm like, love, you know, I have this feeling, this sense in my heart. I don't know if it's the Lord. But I've been sensing the money we gave to daddy. It's like the Lord might be just waiting. No, I'm not saying the Lord has visited me. <laughs> that we pour it out as an offering. And I thought she was going to resist and say, no love, we need the money for the, your airfare. But with a big smile, she looks at me with her hands stretched out and she says, I have no problem. <laughs> and there is a battle that rages on in me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, she should have come to my defense. <laughs> But the other side of me discovers that this is God. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was the trigger. I called my father and I told dad, the Lord says that the money we gave you, we gave to you as his servant. And it's not a loan anymore. It's poured out as an offering. My father blessed us. He spoke blessings over our lives. Up till that time, brothers and sisters, in terms of movement, all I had was a bicycle. Bicycle. Up till that time, we did not have our own church building. I was pastoring with my wife, but we were renting. We did not even have land for our home. But when the man of God blessed <coughs> us, he prayed for us. He prayed for the prosperity of our lives and ministry. That was the year that God provided for my first car. Wow. That was the year that God provided for us not only to buy land for the church, <coughs> but to lay the foundation of the church building. That was the year that we began to build our house and home in Kenya. Think about this. I only come to one conclusion. There is safety, there is joy, there is blessing when we discover the ways of God. I pray that you discover the ways of God and that we can be activated in finding the mantles and honoring the gifts and graces that God has established in the land so that we and receive an impartation of spiritual gifts and our establishment and our security for the nation. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother.